Welcome to today's meeting of the Fire, Resilience, and Emergency Planning Committee. May I please remind participants to turn off your devices or put them onto silent? Members of the public may like to follow at London Assembly on Twitter and use the hashtag AssemblyFire for this meeting. On the agenda today is a discussion on how the London Fire and Rescue Service continues to be reformed five years on from Grenfell. London will never forget the 72 lives lost during the devastating events of the Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June, 2017. Five years on, our thoughts are with the people who lost their lives, their loved ones, and those who survived the tragedy. All Londoners should feel safe in their homes. And today, we continue to stand up for Londoners by examining fire safety issues in the capital. We are joined by the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience and the London Fire Commissioner. I know that both Fiona and Andy would like to say a few words. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to this meeting, which comes at a very difficult moment for everyone affected by the Grenfell Tower fire and for all Londoners who share the horror at the events of that night five years ago. Yesterday, on the five-year anniversary of the Grenfell Tower tragedy, we remembered the 72 people who lost their lives in the fire, those who lost friends and family in their homes, as well as the wider community around them. The shocking images of the Grenfell Tower fire are still with us, as are the stories of those who died in the tower. I particularly want to pay tribute to the Grenfell community for their tireless work over the past five years to make sure we get to the full truth of why the fire happened and to make sure we all abide by our pledge that nothing like this tragedy can ever happen again. I'd also like to thank the London Fire Commissioner and all those working at the Brigade, both for their heroic efforts that night trying to save as many people as possible and for their strong commitment ever since to ensuring the Brigade is fully prepared for incidents like this in the future. The candour with which the Commissioner and his colleagues accept the need to change and the many really positive necessary changes that have already been made is refreshing and encouraging. However, we cannot be complacent. I know that Andy Rowe isn't, and nor should any of us be. Five years on, the brigade has come a long way, but it's still a journey that we have a long way to go. We've heard much moving testimony from survivors and the bereaved over the past few days. We can't help but be moved by it. This anniversary cannot, though, just be a moment of reflection. It needs to be viewed as a call for action. We owe it to all the people who died, the survivors, the bereaved families and the whole community to ensure that nothing like this ever happens again. And if anything, this five-year anniversary strengthens my resolve, the resolve of the Commissioner of the Mayor, to do just that. Far too many Londoners still live in buildings where not enough has been done to make them safe, where they've had to foot the bill for remediation or where improvements are happening far too slowly. The inquiry continues to uncover shocking failures that led to this tragedy, which have to be put right. It is simply not acceptable on any level that shoddy practice in the construction industry is too often the norm, putting the lives of both residents and emergency responders at risk. I welcome the committee's ongoing attention to these issues and hope you, hope you will join us as we continue to press the government, the building industry and the brigade where necessary for the urgent improvements that still need to be made. Thank you. Andy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so obviously this, this is a personal aspect to me. I was there on the night. I was the incident commander. Um, it's very difficult to hear or talk of Grenfell without seeing, again in my head, um, the, the images that I and so many of my colleagues and obviously that whole community witnessed that night. How do I understand it? I understand it as the destruction in a single moment of much of what I hold dear about London. So my experience of London housing estates growing up, you know, playing sports in them, visiting my friends in them, um, my family in them, is that they're places of such life and community, diversity, very often refuge actually for others who have come to our shores places of actually decency uh, and, and, uh, and a mark of, of the sort of civil society we aspire to be. They represent so many of the good things about Great Britain, you know, our great social housing estates. Um, to see one, 
um, I suppose, receive what I almost see as an act of institutional violence received against it that night was truly shocking. No resident of a tower block in modern London should have to suffer what those people did. Um, it pointed to, I think, failure on the part of every institution that should have contributed to keeping those people safe, including in some part my own. What I also witnessed that night was the incredible courage of rank and file firefighters and officers who, despite perhaps not having been best supported by their own institution, threw themselves time and time again into firefighting conditions uh, that I have not witnessed before nor since. And that is speaking as one of the most experienced operational officers in the United Kingdom, I would suggest. Um, I saw them put their lives on the line. I saw colleagues carried out of there repeatedly. But what I saw most of all was the destruction of the hopes and dreams of so many in that community, the loss of 72 of our fellow Londoners in circumstances that were intolerable to me. And all I can promise the committee and wider London is that the London Fire Brigade, in order to um, kind of do the best to ensure that that never happens again, owes it to particularly the bereaved, the survivors, the wider community there, and our own firefighters to make sure that we continue to improve, that we drive change with a rigor, that we don't um, allow ourselves to become complacent nor um, held by our own mythology because actually the only way we can offer some redress some sense of justice i think to that community is to do the right thing is to accept the failings that we identified ourselves and that they have helped identify for us and the inquiry has address them with an energy uh, and in doing so um, fulfill the role that I think London expects us to, which is, is, is to be that safety net for safety in all sorts of places. So thank you. Thank you for the time to make a statement. Thank you. Thank you both. I think as a committee, if we could just, just take a moment to pause and, and reflect on, on what's been said, but also to think about um, that tragedy before we begin the business of the meeting. Before we begin, we have a few small items of business. Can I ask our clerk, Diane Richards, to confirm any apologies for today's meeting? Thank you, Chair. Apologies for absence have been received from Assemblymember Bailey. Many thanks. And can we note the list of offices held by Assembly members? Noted. And can I also ask members if they have any disclosable pecuniary interest in specific items listed on the agenda? And can we note the completed actions arising from the previous meetings of this committee? Noted. Thanks. That brings us to our main item of business, which is the discussion on fire reform in London. Can I welcome our guest to the panel, Dr. Fiona Tricross, who's the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience, and Andy Rowe, the London Fire Commissioner. I'm going to start with a few questions, and then I'll hand off to my colleagues. The London Fire Brigade does not publish information on the work it has done to implement the recommendations of its transformation delivery plan, including the recommendations made by Her Majesty's Inspectorate. What action will the LFB take to ensure it is, beginning, it is being open and transparent and providing a comprehensive overview of the work it is undertaking to transform the brigade? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm slightly surprised by the question, actually, because I think we've been very open about some of the challenges we've faced and, you know, the amount of progress we've made. We've got nothing to hide in this regard. So I think you've provided fair challenge to us. We need to go back and make sure that we just provide that, whether it's directly into this committee, because we report. I've reported since I took over as commissioner first monthly and then on a quarterly basis to the Home Secretary, to the Mayor, to Her Majesty's Inspector, all with the same information. Um, uh, reports that we would be happy to have in the public realm would, would indeed be FOIable anyway. I've seen them as public documents. So we have a very strong audit trail that shows both the challenges and the successes. Um, 
you know, and indeed I sit on a ministerial board where I'm held to account. So for me, I, 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 I sort of see, I see it as all being in a public realm anyway. I think what you've pointed to is some, uh, some sort of um, deficiency in our ability to communicate that um, because w we have all the detail and we are very happy to share it. Um, it it's all there. And I mean, I, I'm expecting over the course of this session, certainly to dive into the detail of that. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and is the delivery of the new breathing appar apparatus, including an integrated communication capability, still on track to be completed by August 2022? And when do you expect the rollout of the apparatus to be complete for all firefighters wearing helmets and breathing apparatus to be able to communicate with the bridgehead? No, I don't think it will be delivered in August. So if you want to talk about challenge, I think that's one of the areas. So we're the biggest user of breathing apparatus, certainly in Europe. Um, and we are the biggest new contract for breathing apparatus in the world. Um, we're one of the primary users. Uh, we, we faced some corporate challenge, mm -hmm. which is subject to some commercial sensitivity, uh, because obviously we ran an open and fair tender process uh, that meant we, we faced the potential of breaking with what had been our historic supplier for, well, as long as I've been in the fire brigade, actually. And we had changed the procurement cycle to integrate comms equipment with breathing apparatus, which we hadn't done before. We needed to, because otherwise you got caught in a cycle where you could never reasonably change your provider. Uh, and that's without casting any aspersions on the previous provider, current provider, potential future provider, because of course that is commercially sensitive. Um, that has brought some delay into the process. It's not the actual delay of um, not understanding what we need or indeed commissioning a process to give us what I need. we need is it's some of the commercial challenges of procuring as one of the largest users in the world of breathing apparatus, the uh, sensitivities of the market uh, and the challenge of procurement on that scale. What I can say is that we have completed our analysis of the equipment we would like through very rigorous field trials. That's the second time we've had to do that because of commercial sensitivities. Um, I think we have clear sight of who will, the provider will be um, but again, I can't divulge that into the committee at this point. Uh, and I expect there to be a delay, but not one that lasts beyond the end of this year, because I need that kit in, because we delayed the re-procurement of integrated comms so that we could do that. We could do a proper integrated procurement, but that in itself meant we've waited longer than I would like. So the answer is that they're one of the last two significant um, recommendations we must deliver. We've delivered 26 out of 29. The last two really significant recommendations I must deliver in the short to medium term are linked to the procurement of communication equipment integrated with breathing apparatus equipment. Thank you for that and thank you for your openness. That's, that's really helpful. Um, coming to you, Fiona, uh, what changes have been made to London's major incidents procedure ma manual in response to the recommendations made by the Grenfell Tower inquiry? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering what changes have been made to London's major incidents procedure manual in response to the Grenfell inquiry? Um, I couldn't comment on that okay. specifically. Um, I was um, anticipating responding to the recommendations on fire. Um, that was what I understood the um, section was going to refer to. I'm, I'm very sorry, but I don't. I don't okay, have a response to, to that. I can get you a response um, um, as, as as soon as possible. Apologies. That, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Assembly Member Deval. Um, to enable the LFB, Met Police and the London Ambulance Service to read each other's messages now. Um, and what are those next steps? And do they have any further information on timescales implement uh, for implementation? Yeah, so this is recommendation number 44 arising from the inquiry. Um, <clears throat> this really is out of our control. Um, so the implementation date is to be confirmed by the Home Office as the centralised hub procurement is still in progress. It's not being procured by us, it's not within our control, so that's within the government's gift to advance the progress on that. Um, we've got some security related work to be completed, but that again 
is dependent on all the other agencies being aligned to enable that to happen. Uh, that, coupled with work yet to be completed with the NPS mobilising system, means that we haven't got a go-live date. Um, we are compliant. We've got the security architecture ready so that we... So basically, we uh, recognise we need to keep the answer short. It's a complicated bit of work. But basically, we're ready, but we are dependent um, on colleagues in the other emergency services and government um, getting to the same place as us to enable it. Because obviously we we had a, we were very motivated to meet that recommendation and sitting so, at the heart of Grenfell. And do we know where those other services are and where government is at the moment? Um, I've got some information here. It doesn't give me deadlines. All, all I've been told is that the NPS's new mobilising system is still being bedded in. So that's going to delay the incorporation of my as I imagine they work through the kind of teething issues of any new mobilising system. To be fair to the NPS... You know, mobilising systems in London are big, complicated affairs that require time, even when you've bought them in and have implemented, to weed out the bugs and, and, and kind of um, challenges of, of, of a multi-layered complex operational environment. Um, we're, we've also got a national dimension to the firework, which is behind where LFB is as well. So NFCC have got to push something consistent across the whole of the national service. We're, we're one of the pilots, which is why we're getting it first, because we stuck our hands up for it. But I've got no sight currently of when the NFCC or central government hub procurement is going to be in place, so I can't give you any firm timescales. It's out of my control. OK. So to, the, to what extent, just explain to me, because I'm new to this committee, about the M emergency services intercontrol channel. So is that up and running? So that's up and running. Running now. So, so, so yeah. the, the question I've got, you can explain the background to it as well if we've got the time. Um, has that been used for major incidents and events since the tragedy? And what's the impact that that's had on the delivery of service? The, the answer is yes, it has. Uh, I would need to write to the committee to give you specific examples, but I think that would be useful. So uh, I know that it has been on a number of occasions. <clears throat> Uh, and I know that it was put in place very quickly because it was seen as an, alt an important interim step in achieving full um, kind of um, MIAC compliance. So that multi-agency information transfer project you've just been questioning me about, that's what that is, MIAC. Yeah. Yeah. So yes is the answer and yes, it's in use. And do you still believe it's an interim step? The only growl, if I can describe it in that way, is in terms of what we're waiting on the other services and the Home Office yeah. to implement. Everyone wants this. It's Everyone. a matter of implementation. So I don't think that we would satisfy the full scope of that recommendation with um, simply maintaining what is an interim solution to that, which is the, you know, the open tri-service channel. OK. So let's turn. This is a question to both of you, and you can work out who wants to go first. So um, a Majesty's uh, Inspectorate reported that the brigade hasn't made uh, enough progress to resolve the causes of concerns it identified during 2019 uh, inspection. Are you confident that su sufficient progress has now been made? A man and how many of the HMI's 26 recommendations from 2019 are outstanding? And, re and what remains the biggest challenge? Right. Would you mind if I went yeah. first? Is that okay? So um, I'm just looking at my notes. I want to make sure I'll give you the right information. In terms of um, the causes for concern, whilst I can't prejudge or talk about um, the results of our next inspection, which is obviously now complete, they're drafting the report. I am very confident, as Fire Commissioner, that we will have cleared the previous causes for concern. Um, uh, and I hope that that is reflected in the report. So I, I'm, I'm confident, and of course we do talk to colleagues in HMRC, HMI, CFRS um, almost continuously. So I think that we've heard that, we heard uh, their view um, in the interim, and then we've worked very hard to clear those down. And specifically, that was really about instant command, um, instant command training and driver training. And I know, because I can see from the figures that we've gone from a place where we were not meeting a standard I would be happy with to a place where I am. And we're well above the 90, 90th percentile in both cases and, and have really addressed the issue of quality and kind of the license to operate with instant command. Um, in terms of the 
HMICFRS recommendations, my understanding is we've completed 17 out of the 26. Um, but I think I would need to come back to you with detail about those we are still fallen short of. Uh, ones that come immediately to mind would be, I think we need, we've got more work to do around um, cross-border preparation and exercising. That's a fairly significant one that I think we need to grip in terms of sharing information and making sure our people are consistently prepared for that. Um, bear with me a second. I think I'll have to write to you with the detail. It'll be 17 out of the 26. Um, uh, and I haven't got all of that information to hand because I, I, I thought we were focusing primarily on the, the GTI recommendations, so that's my fault. Mm. Uh, and we'll write to you with the I've detail. More on the HMI, if that's helpful. It would be, actually. Apologies. Thank you. No, not at all. So, Thank you. Uh, apolo apologies. I, I do have a bit more detail on the HMI. Um, and I think um, I'll start by saying that one of the challenges for the brigade has been... Um, the amount of issues and recommendations that they've needed to deal with over the past few years. So that's not to say that the Brigade hasn't focused on addressing the HMI recommendations and um, criticisms, but um, a huge amount of focus went on fulfilling as, as many of the GTI recommendations as possible in a short space. But what they have done, um, and we've discussed this as they've gone through the process, is made sure that the brigade has focused on the most critical ones, so the ones that sort of um, would represent the greatest risk to London. And so as the commissioner says, the sort of training and incident command, which was actually sort of a massive criticism from the GTI and obviously something that was quite critical to address, and the emergency driving. Um, so I think that the um, those are the two that brigade sort of responded effectively to put new training in place. And I'm hopeful, um, obviously, uh, we've yet to see the report from the HMI, but I'm hopeful that the next HMI CFRS report would recognise the progress that's been made on those. So of the recommendations that are outstanding, there's some that it's disappointing, and I think the Brigade yeah. and the Commissioner would recognise it's disappointing. So, for example... I've, um, I've actually got the deal. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, come, I'll, let, you, I'll let you have a word in edgeways in, in a moment, yeah. but I'll just sort of say the ones that I think... Um, from my perspective, are most disappointing in terms of the timescales are things that run counter to some of the work we're doing on um, equalities, diversity and inclusion, for example. So the, the idea that we have stations in London that don't have suitable facilities for women and that that's not likely to be resolved until uh, 2027 feels like it run, runs counter to... Um, other aspirations elsewhere, but it's to do with the um, with the long-term privacy for all upgrade program that over the size of the estate takes some time. But I think that so 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 that's quite problematic, and that's the one that's delayed um, the longest. But um, and I think that the um, so so the ones that are around fair processes are um, and sort of identifying and supporting high potential staff. Again, that's something that falls within EDI, and I've had a lot of conversations with Andy, with Kate, who was at the last meeting, and with Tim Powell about how we make sure that these are addressed as quickly as possible. But I have to say, I think it's because of the, the number of recommendations, both from GTI and HMI, um, uh, almost coming at the same point, and actually the brigade has had to prioritise, and some of those prioritisations might not be what individual um, committee members or what I might have seen as priorities, but actually, essentially, the focus was on the operational changes that were required, which were life critical in terms of uh, if the brigade were to go out and respond to an incident, you, you actually need those, those sort of risk critical training needs to be met. So that's, that's why I think, um, I think they've done reasonably well, but I think um, you wouldn't give uh, yourself 10 out of 10 no. for, um, for sort of how yeah. progress has been made, but I'll allow you to speak now. Apologies, Commissioner. No, no, it's my fault because I got lost in my tabs, and I didn't. What I didn't want to do, um, Assembly Member Deval, was, was, you know, come off the top of my head on this. It's too important. So this is the detail of it, really. So we've completed 17 out of the 26, uh, bearing in mind that we had in total 66 recommendations, if you include the national multi-agency ones laid against us at the same point. Uh, so again, significant effort made. I think I think it's fair to say that I would expect the the, the inspectorate to come in and say, good effort, 
on the Grenfell recommendations, they needed to be a priority. They're about primary safety, but in focusing on that and the very considerable strategic effort involved in doing so, you haven't made progress in the other areas as much as we would have hoped. I think that if, if that's what they say, that will be fair analysis because it would be my own. Uh, and I think it would be wrong not to acknowledge that to this committee. What have we got outstanding? Um, there's one about our risk-based inspection program around building safety, which I, I think we will cover when we get to the fire safety part. The issue there is actually not our risk-based inspection program because we have the most productive fire safety officers in the country. One of my inspecting officers does 50 audits a year, complex audits in a complex environment, compared to the next probably most efficient service in the country, which is Liverpool, which does 30 audits per inspector per year. The difference is that on the risk-based inspection program database in Liverpool, there's 900 residential buildings. We've got over 29,000. Uh, we're not comparable. We have a million businesses and business premises in London. That's the conservative estimate. That's more than any other country in the UK. So there, there's a difference in scale and resourcing, and therefore what is currently a national framework we have to follow doesn't really work in terms of really managing the risk. It wouldn't include most of the 8,500 high-rises we went out and inspected where we know there's a risk. So actually what we've done to address this one is we can't close it in terms of just meeting the numbers within a flawed inspection methodology. We're not going to do that. That's poor use of, of taxpayers' resources, actually. What we've done is we've volunteered to help reshape the national framework, what's called the FSEC. Um, and, and, and we're continuing to do that. And that's baseline to complete in December 2022 and then we will change as part of CRMP the way we inspect buildings in London. Um, we've made progress and the HMI4 respond in time to building regulation consultations. We've made significant progress in that area. I think the inspection will um, reflect that but will suggest we still need to do better. We piloted a hub approach which uh, showed for a large part of London we could change that that kind of set of results. We need to apply that to the whole of London now. Um, yep, yeah, absolutely. Just Thanks. good warning from the Deputy Mayor not to take too long. So operational debriefs, HMI 8, that's going to be completed actually in Q1 22-23. HM11, uh, allocating resources to activities, that is the CRMP, and of course you're questioning me on that. 12, um, Procurement, you've heard about the challenges of procurement. We've got more to do there. We've got a review of that underway. Um, I think that gives you a flavour. And, and facilities for women, we, we've invested £10 million and have a plan to address that, but it will take longer than anyone will be satisfied with. That's the truth. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm just conscious of time, so we've got yeah. two more Assembly members that want to come in on, this, uh, on these questions. Um, Assembly Member Bakari. Uh, thank you so much. Your words were incredibly powerful and moving at the start so i really appreciate um that must have been tough for both of you to to, to say at the start and, and to bring it back to the, those particular victims and and also the survivors I, I just wanted to touch on that slightly now as well um yesterday we were at the memorial and and, and uh, i met many people there who were still living with a lot of pain and anger to be fair um, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing specifically on your outreach because i know we've talked about this before but um, the wider community, because it's quite a large community there that have uh, have managed to pull together, but also they, they need to have that work with you and, and, and hear from you. And then also, could you please touch on the subject that I'm very passionate about, particularly the Muslim community there as well, and what you're doing in terms of outreach with them? Yeah. Um, so we fundamentally changed our approach to community engagement. We, we, we are in a position now where we proactively seek the conversation with those that are most likely um, to be challenged by our point of view, um, by their experience of us. Uh, and of course that applies uh, to no greater number of people than those who are most greatly traumatised in the Grenfell community. So I've personally met with many within the community over the past two and a half years. Some of those conversations have been very difficult and, and I've, I've had things said to me that were very difficult to hear but I think entirely true so I think we have a completely different approach now in terms of openness that's supported by professional structure so we have a, a community engagement team um, led by a practitioner we brought in from outside the brigade who was really experienced and I think has done a lot um, to change the way we apply a community engagement strategy you know we've had nine pilot boroughs uh, uh, 
using this approach and we've had tangible results. For example, being on the ground uh, during the New Providence Wolf incident, not just with firefighters, but with community engagement specialists who then were immediately able to engage with local residents in the difficult conversations about the safety of their building, the limits of what we could do within the current operating environment, you know, prepared to hear their concerns as leaseholders. This is a different approach. Um, how do I know there's a difference? Not because the challenge isn't still there. You know, I will meet with colleagues from across the campaigning groups within the Grenfell community and residence groups, the faith groups. They will still provide the challenge. The difference is that I'm allowed in the room now mm. and that I can sit uh, and I can listen. And I think there is a growing confidence that we hear them and we will do our best to change. But I would never be complacent in that. I'm only as good as what I deliver. And I would expect to be judged on that rather than warm words in a room because what, 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 what they want is both justice through the courts but also visible change uh, so that they ensure others don't suffer the way they have. In respect to the final part of your question, it's not lost on me that as I sat in Westminster Abbey yesterday, almost every single name that I heard read out was of the Muslim faith and that this, this is a tragedy in so many different aspects. It's a tragedy for people who live in high rises and the people who lived in that high rise on that estate. It's a tragedy for the disabled who were profoundly and disproportionately impacted by the tragedy. It is a tragedy for Muslim people because so many of those who died were Muslim. And I think to, you have to recognize it as that and you then have to speak directly to those groups. So I know that you've been enormously helpful in helping us gain access to some of the Muslim communities in East London. Uh, and I know that we've done some good work there, but I think we would maintain the challenge to ourselves that we've got a lot more to do to prove that we're, we're, we're genuinely in the space where we're hearing communities and are prepared to hear difficult things about ourselves. I'm happy for you to add if you wish, um, Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I haven't got much to add. I'd just say that one of the first meetings um, Andy had when he became commissioner was with um, members of the Grenfell community, people who'd been bereaved by the fire. And I think from the start of his tenure as commissioner, he's been really clear that the brigade has to step towards the difficult conversations they have to have with the community and that only by having those really difficult conversations and being open to change will they actually be part the, the part of the change that uh, that is required that the brigade has control over that's a bit that Andy's fully committed to and and I think um, uh, the fact that he is able to be in the room is a reflection of that but also a reflection on the community for being open to having a conversation with an organisation that they understandably had a huge amount of mistrust towards um, particularly when the recommendations came out and were really damning towards the brigade in the phase one report so just, I won't I won't add more than that Thank just you. lastly deputy mayor I mean we we've have um, suggested an idea of a building safety crisis support hub for, particularly in those kind of issues mental health and and giving support for uh, people who have been affected by this tragedy as well as um, the leaseholder issue, you know, offering some practical financial legal support even to the thousands of Londoners that have been affected by the building safety crisis. Is there any, um, any um, options there at all? Uh, that feels like something that you'd need to talk to Tom Copley about. I'm going to use the, um, the sort of, uh, I, I, it, it, sound, it sounds appealing, but I think that's something Tom Copley was invited, but unfortunately the late notice that of his invitation meant he couldn't be here today. I know he's keen to talk to the committee about some of these issues, including that. So I'd, I'd suggest that uh, you try and invite him along to future meeting to discuss issues that um, I, don't, I don't think he'd be that pleased if I commit to things on his behalf um, uh, in, off, off the cuff in a meeting, but thank you. Thank you. Um, Assemblyman Mayor Rogers. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
this is perhaps one for you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the the Grenfell Tower inquiry rightly sort of pointed to better interagency working as being as being critical. And there's the London Safety Centre Blue Light co collaboration strand that's been running since 2019. I wonder if there's, is there any work going on within that collaboration strand that um, informs on some of the issue, some of the other issues that the uh, the inquiry raised. Um, so the Blue Light collaboration strand, I think, um, is possibly something that um, the Commissioner can talk more to. The blue light panel that sits under the LRF, which I chair, has done a huge amount of work on um, multi-agency response. And um, we've recently had a new um, uh, Met Police officer start chairing that, um, who the chair met when we um, had a visit quite recently. Um, and I think it would be really interesting for the committee to hear direct from those people. We can set up a briefing for you to talk through how they work. But I'm actually really delighted in the way that they've started um, really up in the ante on things like multi-agency training, um, particularly some of you will have heard when you've been observing the um, uh, Grenfell Inquiry sort of reference to a magic course, which um, is very interesting, but it isn't anything about magic. It's actually about sort of learning the nuts and bolts of, of um, multi-agency response. Um, and I think that they're looking at how we can increase the number of courses available um, to London and coming up with really practical solutions to, to make sure that anyone who has to step into that multi-agency response arena and sort of take on those strategic roles within a response is as well trained as they could possibly be. So I, th I think you'd be really interested um, and I'd encourage the committee to look at that in a lot of depth, not least because there'll be recommendations coming both from uh, the Grenfell Tower inquiry, but also from the Manchester Arena inquiry, that we'll, we'll sort of touch on that and touch on the remit of, of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, anything, anything to add? No, only, to, only to say there's been a lot going on in the London strategic space, and actually I'm just conscious of um, time and, and then giving half an answer. Uh, I think we should write to you um, because there are a number of recommendations that di directly relate to the strategic operating protocols in London. A lot of work has been done to as a, as a blue light group, learn the lessons from Grenfell that cut across a number of those. Really happy to provide a detailed answer. And, and apologies, Assembly Member Duval, in giving you a long answer, I still didn't give you a complete one. We will write to you with all the detail because your first question around transparency was well made, Chair. It's all in front of me, even though I couldn't find it in my folder. We will write to you with, with what is a lot of detail set against the recommendations from HMI CFRS. And we'll also, as the Commissioner said, look at how that can be more clearly yeah. signposted on the Brigade's website, because it's, it's, it's an omission if it's not on there. Yeah. It's, not, it's not an intentional Not at all. There's nothing point. to hide on it. No, there was no intent in the way I asked that question, by the way. Um, moving over to Assemblymember Hall. I'll be, I'll be really quick. Uh, given the subject today, Andy, it could be that people that are living in high-rise with cladding are tuning in to listen. Is there anything you can give them as advice, as an example? Should people that have got cladding on a high rise be closing their windows if they're suddenly made aware of a fire? Should they be absolutely looking around that building to make sure people haven't changed front doors, that uh, fire doors are kept open by all sorts of things I've seen when I've gone round buildings? Is there just a couple of things that you can say to anybody watching now, if you're in a high rise with cladding, this is what you should do? That's a great question, thank you. Um, yes, is a short answer. Um, simple tips, if, if there's a fire in your building, uh, what I would hope is before you get to that point, so if people are listening who live in one of the 1,000 blocks that's, that still are in simultaneous evacuation in London, so either with cladding on or other serious defects, number one, I hope you know you're living in one of those blocks because your building owner has got a responsibility to tell you and have a plan for evacuation because you, you, you cannot apply stay put to those buildings. That's why we, we would say they're all in simultaneous evacuation. So number one, know that your building is one of them. If you think your building is clad and you're not sure, seek that advice from your landlord. Actually, if you're worried about any of the things the assembly members just mentioned, if you see things in your building, such as doors that don't have a door closer, things wedged open, um, uh, some concerns around kind of the building fabric of your building that you think might present a fire risk, ring us, tell us, go onto our website uh, and, and we will provide advice and we will come and have a look if necessary. So that, that's what I would say you should do in preparation. Uh, for all those people living in high-rise blocks around London, um, 
if you're in a clad block, please please be assured that if it's one of the thousand that we're aware of, we know where you are, and we have a plan if if we come to your building, uh, and that we know that you will be evacuating that block, and we will have to operate differently there. For all those people who are living in non-clad blocks, uh, where there is still stay put in place, that's important because for the vast majority of buildings, although it is a challenging concept, the way that buildings have been built in this country means that stay put is still, for the vast majority of buildings, the safest strategy in the first instance. My caveat to that is we can no longer rely on the building regulations not to fail, potentially. So our people come prepared for the fact that whether through anxiety or because the incident has accelerated, you may also want to leave your building. Uh, and our officers and crews are now trained to deal with that and, if necessary, initiate their evacuation. In the, in the context of a fire actually happening, close your windows. Um, if you're in one of those blocks that isn't clad, stay in your building unless you're being told otherwise or unless you can see that something's deteriorating you need to make that decision yourself. If you're in one of the clad blocks, then you need to leave the building because it's simultaneous evacuation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're on to Assemblymember Bakari, who's going to um, ask questions on the Fire Safety Act. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Fire Safety um, Act and Fire Safety Regulations, um, uh, do you welcome the commencement and do they go far enough? And what more needs to be done to really protect residents from fire? Uh, yes, we welcome the Fire Safety Order. Um, we're pleased it's coming to force. It gives us very useful additional enforcement powers. Uh, to act against those building owners and managers who haven't taken their responsibilities seriously or properly. How that enforcement works, I think we'll have to see how that is implemented over time, like with all new legislation, how it's enacted in what is a complex ownership and, and um, built environment. Um, the building safety regulations that are going to be forthcoming, really it's all in the secondary guidance. We need to see what guidance underpins those regulations. But again, we welcome that. The fact that we've now got... Um, a legal framework and, and what will be a building safety regulator to look specifically at building safety with a particularly keen eye on fire safety is to be welcomed. But uh, as we have done throughout the process of the passage of both bills, we will continue to provide input, we will continue to um, provide professional advice and we will seek amendments if necessary on the basis of how they become implemented. You can definitely come in Deputy Mayor if you wish. Thank you. Um, I, um, so I think um, the, the key thing to note about the Fire Safety Act is just how long it's, um, it's taking to, to put things right. So I think um, it is very welcome legislation and the Commissioner is 100% correct that it is very welcome legislation. Um, what I would say is that um, while it's been announced that the Act has commenced, there's a difference between commenced and being enforced and it won't be enforced until January 2023. So I think um, the Act itself is relatively simple, um, uh, which is helpful. I think sometimes uh, legislation can be overcomplicated and clarifies that external walls and flat doors are subject to the fire safety order. I have no idea why anybody thought it was a good idea that that wasn't the case previously. And I think um, Assemblymember Hall's point about people having um, doors and uh, changing doors or doors not being open or sort of not being closed and so forth uh, demonstrates that actually uh, common sense would dictate that that would be the case. Um, so I think that um, uh, there are challenges in implementing the Fire Safety Act um, um, and uh, I th but I think that it's it's really welcome that we're getting there but it's just it's just taking a bit too long and I think that um, uh, we're really keen for uh, a bit more pace to be mm. added to, to some I'm of really these I'm really glad you raised that. Um, Commissioner, can you, can you add to why you think it's taking so long? I think it's the complexity of what they're dealing with. I think Grenfell Tower Fire was a shock not just to the London Fire Brigade, but to all the assumptions that were previously held about our regulatory system, which, which had been put in place across successive governments of all kinds. Uh, so it's, it's actually it's the unravelling of... 40 years of understanding in a single moment uh, and a desire not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, should we have done it quicker, all parties involved? Yes. And, you know, and if you were to sit with colleagues in the Grenfell community, they are right to complain about the pace. Yeah. If, I, if I had been at the centre of that 
incident and had lost my family, I would rightfully demand a, a, a quicker pace. But I suppose what I would focus on is they're here now, and now it's about making sure that we use them properly. We identify any gaps that might be there, because you only really know how a regulatory framework's gonna work once you see it mm. in practice, once those buildings are going up or we're inspecting them when we're taking enforcement. So I, th I think, good, they're here. Now let's see how they work. And, and you did ask rightfully about what other challenges I think there might be. I think one of the biggest challenges is competency in the sector. So we fight for every single one of our fire safety professionals because we inevitably pay them less than the private sector are desperate to have those professionals now because they're under scrutiny, they're under pressure. The building sef safety regulator that's being set up wants those staff as well. And yet we are in the most populated um, and dense city in the UK and one of the most densely populated in the world. We need our own people. So we, we've done a lot you know, to, to try and remedy that. But that's probably my biggest challenge actually is um, training and retaining competent staff to do that work in a complex environment. Thank you. Now we've we've talked a little bit about inspectors before. Now, given the inspector inspecting officers can't carry out intrusive surveys in buildings, how prevalent do you think um, withholding information by responsible persons is happening? And do you, and in the city hall and the LFBR are they looking into this? How to address this? Um, I think it's impossible to put a quantum on it because I think I probably need to go back to the base numbers. So you've got to understand this in terms of comparators with the rest of the country, because the vast majority of the London built landscape is, is in many ways unseen in terms of the numbers. Um, we've got 10 million people here. We've got a population density that is 30 times greater than most of the rest of the country uh, around the inner boroughs. Um, we've got probably 95,000 out of the 150,000 um, residential blocks between four and six floors, what they call medium rise. You know, as I've said many times, we've got three quarters, eight and a half thousand out of the 12,000 residential blocks above six floors. Mm. Um, we've gone and looked at all of the ones above six floors, but actually, even if we wanted to look at all 95,000 of the medium rise blocks in London, it would take years to get to them. There is no single database on them because there's not a requirement to have it. So all we can ever do is audit and then make an assumption on the basis of audit. Mm. Am, am I comfortable about how people build buildings in London uh, and how they've maintained them? No, not at all. But I think it's my job to keep on making that clarion call loudly to developers that they need to get their own house in order. Because actually some of the things we saw at Grenfell itself were not just a failure of the regulation, but a failure to even maintain or renovate a building to the old standard, let alone the new standard. And I'm aware that we're still building buildings in an unsafe way in London because we're stopping them by the day. So we get stuff across our desk every day, our building engineering team, that we simply can't allow to progress on a daily basis. So the answer is I can't give you a quantum mm. because the scale of it is too considerable. Um, so we have to drive change in other ways. It seems like the Deputy Mayor agrees with that. Yeah. Um, I was uh, agreeing with Andy in terms of he regularly tells me um, the, the problems they have in terms of the buildings coming through. Obviously, this is something that um, uh, sits within Tom's remit. If you want more specific details about GLA position or act activity on this, I can ask him to send you a, a Thank written you. response. Thank Thanks. you. And, uh, and also about unregistered uh, fire risk assessors uh, being used by housing providers in London. How much of an issue is this and, and how are you working to combat that? I can't give you um, a sense of the scale of that problem. It is an issue. So can we write to you with that yeah, answer? Because I absolutely. would need to go back and ask our people because actually we have a complex um, relationship with responsible persons under current and even indeed even future legislation around who they use as an assessor. So they've got to have a competent assessor. But that, that's a big answer, certainly more than the time than we've got in this committee. Um, and needs to be laid out in writing yeah, to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I do want to touch on the resources that the LFB have and the expertise that you have to provide advice on fire safety matters, but we've touched on that a little bit or, uh, already, but what about enforcement action when it's required? What what does that need now? I think it's, a, it, it's an issue of resourcing and time in the courts. So obviously COVID created an enormous backlog in the courts to the extent that we were considering writing to um, the Ministry of Justice to 
uh, articulate our concern because throughout COVID, there were, during COVID, there was a point where they were not prosecuting any fire safety cases. So that created an enormous backlog. So one is the backlog in the courts, which we're now making progress on, um, you know, working with uh, the court system to do so. And the second thing is about competent resources to take um, enforcement action through the courts, because enforcement in London is often quite complicated. It's complicated architecture, complicated ownership. Um, I don't think we need a bigger fire safety department than we've got. We just need to make sure it is resourced to the level that we've judged is necessary and that we maintain a throughput of competent inspectors and advisors, which, which requires constant energy. And how are you working with the National Fire Chiefs Council and the government to ensure swift enforce, enforcement? Um, really closely because we've got London officers embedded in NFCC in the National Protection Unit, which effectively itself sits in close partnership with the Home Office. I spend 50% of my time as a commissioner talking about fire safety, I, 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 and I have meetings that range from senior civil servant level to ministerial. So I, I think, to be entirely fair, the Home Office, NFCC and the LFB pretty much work in constant partnership to, to address the issues. There's a real energy across both government and the National Service to do something about it. I'm just going to end with the, the Deputy Mayor. I've asked uh, this before. I know it's something that you've said you'll look into. Uh, the LFB and the City Hall are looking at an awareness campaign around the new unlimited fines that could be placed on responsible persons um, and who, who do not complete the follow-up fire risk assessments properly to try and encourage better practice. So is, what's the latest on that? Um, I'd need to write to you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, we're moving on now to fire reform white paper and consultation. I'm just going to remind um, the guests and the assembly members that we've got 20 minutes left and still quite a few questions to get through. So I'm stressing brevity if possible. Um, assembly member Polanski. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Deputy Mayor and the Commissioner, for, for being here and answering our questions. Um, just before I get to the questions, as the Green Group leader just on this committee, <clears throat> sorry, I went to the Grenfell walk last night as well, and I've been every year that we could, other than the COVID year, and I just wanted to also send solidarity to that community and also to thank all the officers and staff who are both on the front line and behind the scenes working so hard for our community. Every year that I've walked, I've felt, I've felt the mournful atmosphere that there are at those marches. Last night, though, in particular, I felt there was a palpable betrayal, and particularly a government that have widened inequality and injustice, and it seems to be getting worse, not better. And the deportation of refugees to Rwanda of a failed one last night is a different subject, but it's, again, the same racial injustice, uh, which is about deregulation and, and not listening and ignoring the voices of black and brown people. Now, to get to my question, the government is saying there's a compelling case for reform of fire and rescue services. I'm deeply suspicious of that because of the deregulation that I've just been talking about. What's your opinion, Mr. Commissioner? Genuinely, I welcome it. I'm not just saying that because I'm a commissioner. I'm saying it because I stood in front of that tower block five years ago and looked at how the erosion of what I saw as professional standards and the national frameworks that supported those standards over probably a 20-year period, the lack of inspection had led to the need for reform. So I'm pretty objective about it because I saw it as letting down hugely courageous public servants, that lack of investment in both the National Fire Service and the London Fire Brigade. So I welcome it. I think actually, um, whilst there'll be elements within that white paper that are contentious for some, depending on what part of the country you're in, the, the kind of governance regimes you have locally, so some difficult questions of governance, whilst there is a question within it around pay and the national frameworks around pay that would drive some controversy, if you set those two issues aside, which there will be rightful debate on and a, a wide range of opinions, the rest of it is focused on professional standards. It is about making the sector more regulated, more professional. It's about supporting firefighters with better training, um, a national college of fire, um, recognising their importance within communities by getting them to swear an oath, putting a code of ethics on the um, on, on on the the sector, which I see as a mark of respect, actually, rather than a burden, because similar ones exist in health and policing and the military. You know. I, I, I took an oath myself as a soldier. I'm entirely surprised I didn't take one as a firefighter because I think it drives both individual responsibility and is a sign of the importance firefighters hold in their communities. Um, so 
I would say I broadly welcome it. It's, it's broad brush at the moment. We'll need to understand the detail. It's in consultation. We will reply to that consultation in detail. What I would always say to colleagues in government is that if you want real change, though, you have to invest. Yes, we have to find efficiencies. We've talked about it on this committee many times. You know, we have our own responsibilities there, and we need to do better. But if you're talking about big hitting change nationally, like a national college of fire, and the kind of drive towards professionalism that I think colleagues in central government want, you have to invest. So I think my other caveat on the paper is I want to see what that level of investment is, because it has to match the ambition. I'm going to um, uh, agree with the Commissioner. I think that uh, fire tends to be quite a Cinderella emergency service in a lot of ways. It comes quite low down the list of sectors that sort of are subject to government reform. Uh, we've been waiting. I think um, I'm, uh, as some of you know, I'm sort of involved in the LGA uh, um, sort of uh, work on fire. We've been expecting the fire reform. It's been promised by Stephen Greenhouge uh, for well over a year, and I think it's not. Um, it's it's really welcome that they've actually looked at what some of the key issues were with the response at Grenfell, and actually sort of recognised that part of that was about recognising the need for professionalism and leadership within the sector. So there's a thread running through from the fire through to the white paper on fire reform that recognises that if you, if, you, if you think that one of the biggest issues was incident command and incident command training, then actually if it is done correctly, and I would caveat that this all has to be properly resourced, as the Commissioner said, and done correctly, a College of Fire gives the sector a status that it currently doesn't have. And actually, the sector having an inspectorate gives it a status yeah. that it didn't have while there wasn't an ins inspectorate, and actually potentially led to some of the issues around uh, the fact that things had changed after Lacknow and then slipped. So that's the sort of thing that an inspectorate could, could have dealt with. So I think the inspectorate coming in, a College of Fire coming in, um, uh, a focus on leadership, professionalism, and so forth is really, really welcome. Some issues, I think uh, um, I'd be keen to make sure that the openness the uh, white paper in its current form has to local determination on governance, I think that's something that um, uh, we clearly had um, uh, cross-party agreement. Um, uh, those of you who were around when we were having the to and fro with El FIPA, where you had the anomaly where you had uh, a mayor of one party and a fire authority that had a majority of opposition members on. It was an absolute nightmare for everyone concerned. It was an anomaly that with a mayoral, um, um, a mayoral system in place, we didn't have a direct link through in terms of the governance. I think it works. It works for us in London. doesn't necessarily mean that it will work everywhere. Um, although I do think that, um, by and large, having a single political um, uh, sort of a, a person in place who has um, uh, holds to account, but is also then accountable, there's there's something quite powerful about that, and it it works for London, as I said. So I think that, but resourcing matters. I think that um, I know that the minister is quite clear that the lack of a pay review body. He said this publicly, so I'm not sort of. Um, breaking any confidences, the lack of a pay review body for fire has potentially been one of the issues with firefighter pay falling behind. Um, but the removal of the national collective bargaining mechanism that is in place needs to be well thought through if that's what's going to happen. Because I think there's some dispute between um, people who are involved in the National Joint Council and the inspectorate and government on the role that the uh, NJC played in the collective agreement around um, the COVID response, I, I felt it did pay, uh, play a really positive role in that. And I wouldn't want to lose that if we went to national, um, national pay negotiation. But I think if the review is done correctly and everybody feels that their views are heard, we could potentially come up with something that works better for everyone. But Am I, am I 
clear that actually having no reform for an entire sector for a significant length of time means that a sector potentially um, falls behind in terms of uh, its sort of status and professionalism. Yeah, I think it's it's broadly um, really welcome um, an awful lot in the in the in the fire reform white paper. That's not to say that what comes out the other end, I won't have any issues with any of it, and we'll be making sure that over coming weeks um, we um, we put in a, a, a full response. And I think um, I'd be very keen um, to have further discussions with uh, members collectively or individually about what, what the changes might mean for London. But the focus on professionalism is actually really exciting because one of the um, discussions we regularly have is about succession planning, um, about sort of the fact that we've got a large number of um, chief fire officers who are approaching retirement, not necessarily got the pipeline coming through, focusing on professionalism, giving people that status and the support they need to succeed as, as corporate leaders as well as operational leaders should make a massive difference to the sector. So um, always, always um, want to make sure we see the detail, but ov overall welcome it. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I understand you're saying you're welcoming it as long as it's done correctly, and I appreciate yep. ongoing dialogue about that because yes. with this government, I'm, I'm not so hopeful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assembly Member Hall. Thank you. I won't bring politics into this because it's not necessary. Um, in what ways will the government's proposed fire reforms support the transformation work that is taking place in the brigade? Andy. I think it's a very similar answer to the one I just gave um, Assemblymember Polanski. It's about um, providing a national framework on, on which to drive continued professionalism. So much of what we've done in response to the Grenfell recommendations has been absolutely supported by NFCC colleagues. They've been instrumental to helping us. You know, I can't thank them enough. Um, but what this does is formalise what is expected of a firefighter in their communities. It formalises their role as a professional in a way that is not currently um, done in the same way as, for example, a paramedic or a police officer might find. So I think what it does is it, it provides a, a very useful, as long as we enact it properly, set of structures and national supports for continued professionalism of a service that has probably lagged behind some of the others, some of the other sectors, whether it's health or, or, or policing or the military. Um, so I, I think it's a really good step forward, but we do need to see the detail. Uh, and to all credit to the Minister, I, I know that he is lobbying for the sort of investment uh, required. Yes, Stephen Greenhouge is an extremely good um, minister and, and does care, as you know, you've had lots of conversations with him. Uh, do you believe that the fire and rescue services should have the flexibility to deploy resources to help address current and future threats faced by the public beyond core fire and rescue duties, including the wider public health agenda as suggested in the white paper? And what would this mean specifically for you? The answer is yes but you, you then need to reflect that in the reward you give your people. I think just putting it plainly. So if I look at comparators of pay, a London firefighter is on about 40,000 a year at the top of the pay scale. There's, there's no increments to it. A police officer after seven years service with no additional specialisms can earn something closer to 48,000 pounds plus. Now they're not entirely the same job, but actually in the broad comparison of their risks and what they're exposed to, that there's a lot to be, to, to be seen in comparison. I would suggest that we do need to broaden out what we could deploy firefighters to, but that needs to be recognised in the other bit of work within the white paper, which is really being clear about what we expect of firefighters, the flexibility we expect to be in their, their kind of role, and then reward them appropriately for that. What does it mean for London? I think we already do it, to be honest. It's, it's how we got um, 600 firefighters, Korean ambulances. It, it's what you see... Um, in the delivery of 21 million items of COVID PPE, um, um, care packages for Afghan refugees when there wasn't a cross-local authority model to distribute those. So I think our people are really prepared to do this all the time. We just need to unlock some of the national mechanisms that will enable that. Okay. I mean, firefight uh, firefighters can strike, police officers can't. Do you think, if you're looking for more parity, that firefighters should be stopped from striking? same as the police officers? I think it's a distraction. My experience uh, of, at the point you 
get to industrial dispute, there's normally a very long run up to it. And I, I've had a long history of being involved in industrial dispute in London, particularly as a senior officer. My experience of it is it normally tells a story of failure much early, much earlier on in that process in terms yeah, of... But yes or no though, Andy, if you want parity there, do you, do you think that firefighters should not be allowed to strike? No, I'm not looking for that. Because I think if you run your service properly, you don't get to that point. And, and actually what I would be much more focused on is being in the first instance really clear about what we expect because if we're really clear about what we expect and that is then mirrored in the national frameworks actually there's very little need for firefighters to strike you know and I, I accept that I just if, if, if you're comparing different jobs then obviously there, there is a, a, that the fact that they the police officers can't strike is taken into consideration that's what that prompted that question a it, it's absolutely. not a question I expected to be asking but since we're you compared them I was just wondering no, I think it's a completely fair question and that's my honest opinion which is that we could make that the focus and actually government uh, had had this conversation with me and I'd offered the same opinion which was it would become a distraction because what we would do is we would focus on the right to strike and I completely understand people's view on this this is an emergency service no one yep. wants an emergency service going out I don't want people going on strike no. most firefighters I know are deeply uncomfortable when they're in that position and don't want to go on strike either. So there is, there is some validity to having the argument. But my experience of industrial relations in the fire service is that that would become the focus of reform rather than actually the professional systems and change to the role properly rewarded that I think should be the focus of it. Uh, and, you know, that really would be my personal and, and professional opinion. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Assemblymember Rogers. Thank you. I'm going to go straight to question F, um, and I'll direct this one I'll d uh, initially with the, to the deputy mayor. And you can um, you can pass to the commissioner if you if you wish. So you've got uh, five priority uh, areas have been identified for professionalising fire and rescue services, which are leadership, data, research, ethics, and clear expectations. Um, how do you think the improvement in these areas would strengthen the work of the London Fire Brigade? I think I think that um, uh, I think I mean I think the brigade is doing quite a lot of this already, um, but that's not to say that having a national program uh, that will improve it, that will be sector wide, isn't going to be hugely beneficial to London. We always try to recruit into the London Fire Brigade, but sometimes we struggle. Um, so, um, and I think that's not just because uh, different fire services are a different scale to London. It's 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 a sector wide issue. I think that um, any kind of equipping service leaders with new skills, understanding uh, the the research capacity I mean why wouldn't we want more research um, as part of the work the brigade has done to uh, towards the implementation of the Grenfell recommendations for example the brigade commissioned um, uh, a huge amount of research so for example on the um, uh, the the impact of fighting high-rise fires on uh, the physical impact of that on firefighters and so forth. I mean, you've, you've had to, they've had to commission a huge amount of research that will and should benefit the whole sector. But understanding how um, that will um, be done across across the piece and ensuring that people have a better understanding of, of data, it can't help but um, help the, the sector. It, to me, it's so obvious that I'm finding it hard to, to answer why it would improve things because I think it's quite clear that it's 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 not necessarily always been there previously but maybe we didn't understand what the lack of that meant and I think that um, I, I think it's just really welcome thank Excellent. you uh, Commissioner anything to add uh, just I think one of the, the the few positive things to arise out of Grenfell was that actually there's there's been a renewed focus across all stakeholders that research should like the center of decision making mm. We're still not there yet as a sector again if I look at colleagues in policing the military and health there is a different level of investment and evidential transport different level of evidential kind of um, back into decisions based on years of uh, uh, you know empirical evidence and research but to just give you an example of what Grenfell has triggered it's everything from colleagues in government um, 
you know, looking at the science of evacuation to the Fire Brigades Union undertaking one of the biggest studies ever of firefighter health mm -hmm. in relation to contaminants. Yeah. Welcome both of those from very different stakeholders. Uh, our own research into firefighter fitness and the really quite disturbing results are, are coming out of the trials to examine what happens to the physiology of firefighters when they're in very tall buildings. You know, and we are the most high-rise built, you know, built environment in Europe, soon to be one of the most high-rise mm -hmm. in the world. So I think the answer is, it's, it's been given a kickstart by Grenfell. Uh, there's bodies like the Fire Research Trust, which actually have a fair amount of investment they can make, and we're engaging with them. We're in the early stages of that, a and with colleagues in government who are supportive of this. But we could do more. And to go back to the paper, white paper on reform, I also think the white paper on reform in there, there is a mechanism through the College of Fire and a reshaped NFCC to drive more of that. I think that'll be one of the other positive outfalls if it's invested in correctly. Okay, thank you. And we're now going to move on to emergency evacuation information sharing, which is going to be led by somebody member Polanski. Uh, just to say, we are at 10 past three, so we're just coming to the agreed time. This is the last section of questions we're going to ask, though. Um, so it's just going to be probably about, well, as quick as we can make it, but, but, but another 10 minutes, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've asked you both previously about personal emergency evacuation plans. It was actually last time in the context of flooding, um, and this is obviously in, in, in a very different context, but they've both um, tragically resulted in, in loss of life, both in this country but around Europe. Now, since we've had those conversations uh, where I expressed concern, Lord Greenhoff, uh, at the third reading of the Building Safety Bill on 4th of April 2022, said, on proportionality, how much is it reasonable to spend to do this? at the same time as we seek to protect residents and taxpayers from excessive costs. I hear that as a human life is too expensive to have these emergency evacuation plans. Um, what do you feel about this, uh, Commissioner, in particular, the government's plan to abandon peak proposals? So, um, and this isn't written down. One of the numbers I remember from Grenfell is that in the tower, I believe 30 seven disabled people lived, registered disabled. Of those, I think 15 of them died. So that's 40% of the disabled residents at a tower perished in that terrible event. Um, I want to take the politics out of this because it's a difficult subject to address. And it's very easy, I think, to start playing, the, you know, if I'm brutally honest, for politicians to start playing the blame game. I don't want to do that. This is about disabled residents, thousands of them in London, living in high rise blocks. I don't, I don't, certainly not today, do I want to want to enter a kind of politicised debate about the rights of those people because actually all I'm clear about as London Fire Commissioner is I'm here for the safety of all London residents. If we have a thousand blocks in London that now need simultaneous evacuations, they're not safe enough to live in, we simply can't say to the able-bodied residents, you have to leave as part of an evacuation because this building is not safe and leave disabled Londoners in that block for us to rescue. It's neither morally nor legally justifiable. So in the highest risk blocks, I have always been clear with colleagues in government, despite the challenges, that some form of PEEPs has to exist. It simply has to. Because whilst we will get there in six or seven minutes, um, it will take longer to implement a plan, to get up onto the higher floors, to rescue people, to deal with the challenges of inevitably a single staircase. Uh, we will, of course, prioritise the vulnerable, but in the chaos of a high-rise incident, and it is chaotic, you know, colleagues, you visited Paddington, I know you're going to come out onto the high-rise exercises, you will see the operational reality. We have to do something for disabled residents before we arrive. It's, it's that straightforward. Um, what that looks like is, is why the government's consulting. So I welcome the consultation. We will be replying in detail. My own intent is to sit with the disabled groups and individuals and listen and learn, because if there's one thing I've taken from Grenfell, it's that you don't start with your own opinion, you start with the opinion of the people it is most likely to impact. So I will be starting with them to hear their voice, because they are so often unheard in London. And we will sit with other people who have con conducted evidence into this area, and we will take their opinion and then we will come to a considered judgment on what we need to do as an emergency service to support the most vulnerable people in London. And I would urge everyone involved in this debate, if we can, to try and remove the politics, because unfortunately, regardless of wherever your position on this, and I'm really clear, 
we must do some form of PEEPs in the highest risk box. We must. That's my position as an emergency service. I recognise that colleagues on all sides of this debate are dealing with a 40-year-plus of legacy of housing policy where we have thousands of disabled people perhaps living in places that are not ideal for them and that what we don't want to do is, is remove their sense of safety nor make it impossible to live in those places. It, it is a complex area, but there is a base moral um, and, and kind of safety position that I must hold as London Fire Commissioner. Uh, and that is how disabled Londoners deserve the same equality of evacuation, the same rights as their able-bodied neighbours. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Deputy Mayor could ask about your plans on the government's consultation on emergency evacuation information sharing um, plans. So um, I am going to comment, but I would I would like to say again that um, uh, it's, it is Tom Copley who will be leading a uh, sort of compilation of the response. But I think um, uh, I feel so strongly about this that I'm not going to use my normal um, you'll need to get Tom along answer, um, although I think he probably would want to discuss this with committee members. Um, uh, the Commissioner's uh, spoken quite powerfully on this. I'm really concerned that what's being proposed, um, what's being consulted on, and I'm, I, I'm relieved we're still at the consultation stage because it means that there is an opportunity for reflection, that dialogue with the people that would be affected to actually get back much more to uh, the principles of the... Um, uh, the, the, the PEEP. So basically the emergency evacuation information sharing is not what was um, envisaged by the um, inquiry in terms of um, all people with mobility limitations in high-rise buildings having personal emergency evacuation plan. I'd like to, to see the government go back to the principles of the recommendation even if, uh, even if it's, it's complicated. I am quite clear that had Andy sat in front of this committee and said that um, one of the recommendations was um, that they've completed now was too difficult, some of them were really difficult to implement, I feel quite strongly that um, the, the principle and the sort of um, objectives of the recommendation by the Grenfell Tower inquiry um, should be met um, and I'm really hoping that when um, uh, I am sure that the government will get quite strong feedback on the current consultation and I really hope that they take this opportunity to step back from what I think would be a retrograde step in terms of the safety of uh, all people with mobility issues who live in tower blocks but particularly those in London who um, who would be affected uh, potentially by uh, the proposals being consulted on. Thank you, and thanks for wading in on that, even if it's not necessarily yeah. your direct no, area. I do feel quite strongly on it. Thank uh, you. Um, Chair, I have some more questions, but I believe Assemblymember okay. Bakari wants yeah, to come in. Assemblymember Bakari. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. You, you go, go, go yeah, very, very quickly, I am glad that you, uh, that you did mention that you went straight back to the Grenfell because this is so vital that we keep doing that because of those 15 people who died who were disabled. But also there was a consultation that 83% of the respondents actually were supportive of, of PEEPs as well. So we do need to mention that too. I, I just want to have clarification. You said you, it, uh, this isn't political, this is absolutely not. But will you be working with the government um, on, on making sure there's evacuation plans? But will you be working on them? That is regardless of building height. Could you clarify that point, please? I think I think it has to be related to building height and building design, because that's that's how peeps works now in the commercial sector, where peeps have been ex in existence for years. So it's got to relate to the risk. And at the moment, we're talking about peeps in the context of high rise. I think there's a general question around how we ensure disabled people are given access to proper housing in London, um, which is aligned to this, which cuts across all building types, doesn't it? Um, but in terms of what this consultation is about, it's about high-rise buildings above the sixth floor where, frankly, disabled residents are going to be at the greatest risk um, if, they're, if they're not able to evacuate when they need to. Um, does that answer your question? Apologies. Yes, um, but 
risks. I it. hope that we don't forget that aspect of the fact that there, it, there, there are risks at every level of building height so that, you know, as long as we make sure we clarify that and that you have responded to this, but I can see where, you're, where your line well, is. It's not in scope inside yeah, the consultation, absolutely. Yeah. but I think there is a general point here. It, I was struck actually, I went to the Crossrail opening and one of the first people I met was a, a disabled rights campaigner who had campaigned very successfully for equality of access across the Elizabeth line. And there's something for me about how big public sector organisations, you know, and, and I didn't mean any reference to politi politics disrespectfully, by the way, it's just it's not my role to. It's not my role to make a political judgment or determination. It's inappropriate. But actually, I think there is a role for big public sector organisations like my own have responsibility for safety particularly to act as advocates for our disabled Londoners because I think their voice is, is sometimes drowned out. Uh, there, there's a huge disabled population in London who deserve to be heard. So whether it's just we allow their voices to be heard or listen and, and enable, I, I think that's quite important. So I, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about all aspects of how we ensure disabled Londoners are kept safe in their, in, in their places of work uh, and where they live. Okay, Assembly Member Cooper. Um, I, wanted to, sorry, no, I wanted to follow after we move on to C, sorry, um, with the um, person-centred fire risk assessment. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and just mindful of time, if, if we could wrap yeah, up the section move on. in, in um, less than five minutes. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I totally agree that it would be inappropriate for you to wade into politics. I do want to push back slightly that this isn't political because I think you know no one knows better than you that this is a matter of life or death. And I think these are about priorities and decisions that the government make and the mayor makes. And it's important for us to scrutinize that. Um, so with that, there's the government's pr proposal to require responsible persons to self-identify, or sorry, for people to identify to responsible persons if they're needed for evacuation. Is this suitable? And if not, what challenges might there be with it? Um, I think the concept is suitable. So I think something that's got lost in the PEEPS consultation because there's not clear reference to what I think there is a need for, which is personal evacuation plans for the most disabled people in the highest risk blocks. Actually, the baseline concept of an EEIS is useful. So uh, actually, to answer your question, uh, I think every single high-rise building um, owner and manager should provide information as a point of principle to fire services about where the vulnerable residents are. Now, there are some, there are some good reasons for suggesting people have to self-identify because, of course, it is people's own right protected under law as to how they both identify themselves and the willingness with which they, they might have to share that information. So there is, a, there is a complexity to this. But wherever possible, we need to encourage residents to give that information. And I expect uh, uh, at the end of this cons consultation, regardless of the difficulty of the debate around PEEPs, that my officers and crews, when they turn up to a high-rise incident, will in the future have the information on every vulnerable resident that's in there, and it is the responsible person's um, duty uh, under law to provide that information as far as is possible, because that, again, will make a real difference to the most vulnerable people in those blocks. doesn't answer the question around peeps, though. It's just, it's, it's just that is actually your baseline for when we turn up to respond. Um, we have to come back to peeps. And I think you're right to push back, by the way. It, it is inherently political because of the debate. I suppose what I'm asking for is that we focus on working together to, to solve it because this is a problem created over successive governments, years of regulation, and it is going to be difficult to unpick. And what I would like the focus to be on is not the political debate, but the voice of the disabled. That, that, that is my genuine wish as Fire Commissioner, and we have to create the space for those people to be really heard uh, so they can explain what it's like to live in those blocks and what they really need. I think that's heard loud and clear. Thank you. Um, and what impact do you believe the proposed person-centred fire risk assessment will have on the work of the brigade? Uh, I think it's going to increase our workload, but it's entirely necessary. So we will have to adjust how we commit our resources to focus on that. I think it's a good proposal and we must do it. Um, I notice that it particularly centres on fire. Would you like to see other risks involved too, like the flooding, for instance? I think it's something we could definitely look to. I think that's a really valid point, actually, and a fair challenge. I think it's something we could look to in terms of looking beyond the immediate risks of fire. I suppose our focus is on this at the moment because it's a very particular problem we're trying to address. But I think, again, we're going to talk about CRMP within this committee, and there's a lot of informal kind of information sharing before we get to that formal point. I would really welcome that conversation with, with yourself and others about how we can widen what, what we understand in terms of the risk to the individual in London. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Assembly Member Cooper. 
Thank you so much, Chair, and uh, also thank you, Assembly Member Polanski, for allowing me to come in at this point. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of the individual fire risk assessments, I mean, I was at uh, teaching fire station yesterday with um, the borough commander, John Snellgrove, and the, um, the station manager, and one watch was on when I arrived and another watch came in, and I got the opportunity to talk about the home fire risk assessment visits and also... The, the great need for them and in many cases they have got individuals recorded and they work very well through the community safety partnership with the local authority and other partners in the borough however a point that they were all making is that um, people have a disability when the original assessment might have been done and obviously this is going to take this on to a new level and then their disability will change and then it's not in, uh, re-informed back to the fire service to say that they're new and changed situations. So someone might put on more weight, their dependence on oxygen th because of COPD might, uh, you know, well, it is a progressive illness. So, you know, over two years or three years later, it might all be very different. And I just wondered, have we thought through the impact on the work of the brigade and how are we going to make sure that we get them updated? Because you, you can't just do a snapshot of somebody's um, individual fire risk assessment um, and, and their requirements yeah. for being evacuated. Uh, it's actually right. something that needs to be re revisited as their progressive illness it, might develop. It's a change I'm absolutely certain we'll see as part of the, the you know, the Your London Fire Brigade, the new CRMP. So we've got to build a structured review process in, uh, at the point of initial assessment. So if it's clear that someone has a progressive illness or that we, because of their level of vulnerability, we need to come back and check again at regular intervals, we're going to build that into the process. It's about becoming more focused on individual vulnerability than chasing just the big numbers. I, th I think the concern that I was hearing yesterday is that um, perhaps partners, um, so local authority partners, possibly because they're busy and they're focused on other aspects of someone's welfare, won't remember on a regular visit round to somebody's house to think, oh, I just need to let the borough commander know that something's changed or the station manager in Tooting or Wandsworth or wherever it is. How, will, how are we going to get partners we, we've, to We've got to build it into seriously. our own process. So, yes, we've got to do better in terms of partnership, sharing of information, but there's challenges across 33 kind of different boroughs for that. So, actually, we've got to build it into our own process, which is if one of you know the colleagues you spoke to yesterday, if, if a crew of those go in, do a person-centred risk assessment, they can see there's a scale of vulnerability that means we've got to build in a mandated review process. So you've got to go back there in a year's time just even to check it's the same. We'll do that. That's one of the proposals within CRMP, is that we don't think you can just take this snapshot and you don't just rely on partner information. We recognise we have a responsibility ourselves to that individual and therefore we go back. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, that, that brings us to the end of the first part of the meeting. So thank you to our first panel of guests for you. your contributions today. We will now move on to our second panel. Um, Oh, she's on screen, look at this. Okay, this is my first hybrid meeting, how, to, to chair one anyway. Um, so a very warm welcome to Ritu Saha from the UK Cladding Action Group who is joining us virtually. And we had hoped to be joined by those directly impacted by uh, the Grenfell tragedy. However, representatives were unable to, to, to be with us today, but we do hope to engage with them in the very near future on this committee. And also thank you to Charlie Pugsley, who is the Assistant Commissioner for Prevention and, and Protection from the London Fire Brigade. Just wait for everyone to get in. We'll just be a minute while Charlie gets in place. Okay, as our first questions are for you, Ritu, we'll, we will track on with that. Assemblymember Cooper. Sorry. Hi, hi, Ritu. Thank you so much for um, joining us. You'll have heard um, Assemblymember Polanski um, just asking about the um, personal emergency evacuation plans. Um, and I just wondered if uh, you had any thoughts about either what the Commissioner had said um, or about the government's plans, which appear, broadly speaking, to be 
suggesting that we don't really go ahead with uh, with them? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for uh, having me on the panel. Um, on this particular question, I would uh, like to speak uh, not as a representative of UK Cladding Action Group, but as a leaseholder, as um, a volunteer director in my RMC, and therefore a responsible person in my block, um, as well as somebody who has done personally evacuation management responsibilities themselves. Um, so uh, first of all, I think it is is uh, absolutely abhorrent that any person in the country should be told to stay put in um, a building that is you know uh, not safe or that is on fire and everybody needs to have equal opportunity to be able to get out um, i think there have been concerns raised by the governments on peeps uh, on the issues of proportionality practicality and safety um, I do not agree with uh, you know, what they have mentioned in terms of uh, uh, safety reasons for uh, not uh, having disabled people evacuate before the fire and rescue services arrives, arrive. Uh, I think that is wrong. Uh, but I do think there are, um, for me personally, as a leaseholder and uh, an RP, uh, concerns about uh, proportionality and uh, practicality. Um, on practicality, um, you know, for uh, uh, peeps uh, need to be uh, a 24-7, 365 day foolproof uh, plan. Um, and uh, I, you know, have tried and uh, I will not be able to create such a foolproof plan uh, because simply speaking, without, um, you know, hiring people in case of a mobility impaired uh, resident, um, without actually hiring people 24 7 i will not be able to create a plan to allow them to evacuate a building before the fire and rescue services arise and in terms of proportionality um, and that is going to obviously incur a substantial cost i'm only talking about this particular scenario and um you know those costs will fall on leaseholders, including the you know uh, disabled person if they are a leaseholder, including everybody else in the block. So when we are talking about peeps, uh, we do need to be considering um, the costs of implementing peeps. And my personal view is that uh, the, any and all costs of implementing peeps should be borne by the government. Um, it is a human right after all. Uh, but I am afraid I do not think that is the position uh, of uh, that the government is going to take. Uh, so who does bear the cost of peeps? Uh, and that concerns me. Okay, thank you. Um, and what about um, your assessment of the government's consultation on the emergency evacuation information sharing plans? Um, do you think the proposed reforms are going to be enough to protect vulnerable people? Um, Honestly speaking, I don't think so, because they only relate to a small subsection of uh, buildings which are under a simultaneous evacuation strategy. I do believe there needs to be a plan um, for all buildings, irrespective of whether they are stay put or simultaneous evacuation. I do believe that the fire and rescue services should know if there are um, residents in any building that may require assistance uh, during evacuation or uh, rescue not just a certain uh, subset um, also i think that you know these um, uh, i can't remember the technical term that has been used for them but you know where they go um, but the proposals are to uh, visit uh, the premises and then um, put in pla place uh, you know uh, additional measures uh, to make those premises safe um, I think it is extremely wrong that the costs of such modifications are being proposed to be borne by the resident uh, in that particular unit. Again, I think that that is definitely a cost that should be borne by the government. And uh, I find it extremely shocking that that has even made its way into the consultation, frankly. Uh, I'm going to ask you about the uh, person-centered fire risk assessments uh, in a second. But first of all, um, do you agree with the government that the initial changes in legislation should focus on those buildings um, with the greatest fire safety risk and also the ones that have the simultaneous evacuation strategies in place? Do you think those should be um, looked at first? Well, 
I mean, I would have uh, thought that that was a question that we should consider maybe one day, one month after Grenfell Tower. Um, but it has now been five years uh, since the tragedy. And, uh, you know, um, fire and rescue services, the government, all stakeholders have had enough time to get their act together. Uh, we also cannot guarantee uh, that, you know, uh, buildings that do not have a simultaneous evacuation strategy are safe because they simply may not yet have been surveyed. You know, the government's own figures say that there may be 10,000 buildings across the country which require, you know, which have combustible cladding or other fire safety defects. We simply don't know. So I think excluding uh, such a huge proportion of buildings uh, from this and only maybe gradually phasing them in uh, would not be appropriate from the point of view of safety. So generally, I th uh, would it be fair to say that you think that starting it at this point is very, very late and that the consultation and the proposed changes are uh, not sufficient in particular for leaseholders? Um, yes, that is correct. But as I said, uh, we definitely need to also take into account issues of proportionality and practicality and costs. And so with regard to the um, person-centred fire risk assessments, do you believe that the proposed person-centred fire risk ass assessments is going to be enough to protect vulnerable residents? I'm guessing you're probably going to say no from what you've already answered to my previous questions. Yes, but I, I think what we need to be doing is speaking to uh, the residents who will be most impacted by this. Uh, I think their voices are the ones that need to be heard the most. What are they going to be comfortable with? You know, what sort of support are they looking for? Uh, what are their expectations? Um, and uh, I think that, that those voices have not been heard yet. Uh, but uh, as I said, on, on the person-centered risk assessment approach, um, as specifically with regards to any modifications required, um, the cost for that falling on uh, the residents themselves is absolutely unacceptable. Thank you very much, Ritu, and thank you for um, joining us today. Um, it's a shame that we weren't also able to have some of the people directly impacted by um, Grenfell, which we had hoped to today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Assemblymember Moema. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is to Ritu. Good afternoon. Um, do you believe the Building Safety Act um, delivers in terms of protecting leaseholders and residents from building safety defects? And within that, I know there are some um, conversations about limits of around £15,000 for those costs for people in buildings under 18 metres. Uh, sorry, 11 metres. Um, I would really welcome your thoughts on that. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I will be speaking um, on behalf of the UK Cladding Action Group and um, I will be talking specifically about uh, buildings that already are standing today, uh, not buildings which are due to be built. Um, and looking at the Building Safety Act in that context, um, I do not think that the Building Safety Act goes far enough um, to protect leaseholders and uh, residents. Um, the first issue is that this is an act which has actually been passed and makes the innocent victims of the building safety crisis um, responsible uh, for uh, paying for the negligence and maybe possibly criminal actions of uh, various perpetrators. Um, we have uh, an act which says that uh, residents in you know uh, buildings outside London have to pay up to £10,000 uh, for fixing non-cladding fire safety issues and within London um, the, you know there is a cap of £15,000 on uh, flats uh, lower than £1 million and the cap is much higher uh, for properties above that uh, value. Uh, the Act is also arbitrarily excluding certain categories of leaseholders, for example, small uh, buy to little landlords who did the right thing and uh, you know, invested in property uh, for their uh, retirement. Um, it excludes uh, all leaseholders living in buildings under 11 meters, regardless of the level of risk in those buildings. You know, an under 11 meter building could be covered in ACM from head to toe and the leaseholders would have to pay any and all costs associated with remediation. I mean, I have been contacted by a retired electrician who has nine um, uh, flats with a total combined value of 800,000 pounds. 
um, who is looking at a remediation bill of 250,000 because all nine of his uh, flats are in the same block. The reality is that these exclusions mean that buildings will not be made safe. Uh, they will simply not be able to raise the funds uh, to, uh, you know, be made safe. Uh, so I think the Building Safety Act completely uh, fails uh, lots of leaseholders. Um, and it also has made, uh, the act is going to make uh, living in multi-occupancy buildings very, very expensive, significantly more expensive uh, than it is right now. Well, uh, than, than it was uh, before the Grandville tragedy. And um, uh, in the context of uh, resident management companies and um, uh, right to manage companies, it imposes uh, punitive criminal actions, um, you know, uh, and on people like me, a volunteer uh, director um, in my RMC, um, if I fail uh, to fix fire safety defects that were no fault of my own. Um, that is going to uh, pose even more challenges. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that that has been thought through very carefully in terms of um, you know, uh, buildings that are already existing. And um, th the last point, I want to make is that you know in terms of the building safety act um we are now five years on from grenfell and um you know people should realize that fire is not going to wait um you know all the stakeholders that were responsible for this crisis should realize that for five years uh, innocent people like us have been imprisoned in limbo uh, by government and by other stakeholders because they all refuse to do the right thing um, at the moment, the Building Safety Act is telling developers uh, to pay up to remediate buildings. And we are now entering a situation where developers are entering into lots of negotiations with managing agents, freeholders, asking for many more surveys, trying to uh, squeeze out of their obligations by saying, oh, you know, this building is under 11 meters, or my survey proves that the building doesn't need remediation. And we are going to see these arguments go on for many, many years. Now, fire is not going to wait for these arguments to play out. Um, what we would have liked is for the government to pay up front fix these buildings and recover the money from whoever they thought was responsible. Uh, but unfortunately, the Building Safety Act has failed to do that. Thank you. And so um, obviously, we don't want to relitigate what has been discussed before in this committee. But I wonder what your thoughts are about what clarification around the responsibilities of managing agents um, who often act as a, a middleman um, between mm -hmm. leaseholders and building owners and um, even freeholders in many cases, the developer might be different. So I just wonder what clarifications would be helpful to simplify this so that there is at the very least some transparency about the costs incurred, bearing in mind that whoever, whether it's a leaseholder or in the case of those people who tragically died at Grenfell, it's a local authority that would ultimately be responsible for those costs. Um, what, what would you want to see? So um, I'll speak on, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, private buildings managed by managing agents. <clears throat> managing agents need to be statutorily regulated. At the moment, they are not. Um, there have been many recommendations made um, to our government for statutory regulation of managing agents, but that has not come about. Um, Various stakeholders, including managing agents, get a commission uh, from every piece of work that is done. Um, they collect money from uh, leaseholders, but they uh, report only to freeholders. They are not responsible to leaseholders in the vast majority of cases for their actions. So um, statutory regulation is critical, um, you know, making managing agents aware of the responsibilities of maintaining and keeping a building safe needs to be simplified. We cannot have managing agents going through, uh, you know, 600 or whatever many pages of PAS 9980 trying to figure out what their responsibilities are. Uh, that's not acceptable. Um, and uh, we also need to start uh, bringing about a culture where managing agents realize that the people who uh, pay uh, for their services are the ones to whom they should be accountable to. Um, and transparency and communication would be very important in that regard. So I think um, simplified uh, 
uh, instructions to managing agents that these are now your new responsibilities under the act um, issued immediately would be the first step in that direction. Thank you. Um, and I had a question before you arrived, uh, the commissioner and the um, deputy mayor had talked about concerns they had for people who are disabled um, in um, in that particular conversation in tower blocks. But I wondered on a related note, um, just your um, whether or not you, um, you're content that residents in care homes or sheltered accommodation um, have um, equal protection or sufficient protection I think of buildings which might be maybe new developments which are mixed tenure so you have leaseholders living aside some people who might need um, additional care or support needs um, whether they are sufficiently protected in your view at the moment I don't believe they are um, uh, and uh, again uh, I think everybody needs to have equal uh, protection and the equal ability to uh, escape in the case of an emergency I mean I'm going to Give an example of um, the, the, you know basic things like um, uh, two staircases um, in um, blocks of flats. Um, England still does not require or mandate two staircases in blocks of flats of any height. Uh, we have one of the most lax uh, bits of regulation in this country in this particular regard. If you're talking about, um, you know, I'm, I'm leaving aside the issue of care homes, they're not going to be high rise, but you know, if you're talking about London, we have buildings springing up every day, high rise blocks, uh, medium rise blocks with single staircases. There simply does not appear to be any, um, you know, um, uh, uh, motivation by those in power to fix this basic issue. Um, so uh, I, I think a lot more needs to be done in order to uh, protect uh, leaseholders, care home residents, you know, residents of any multi-occupancy building. Um, and there are a lot of conversations which we should be having and moving things forward, which are not having, happening right now. Okay, and so within your um, campaigning work, um, I understand that you do work to represent um, the views where possible of, of tenants, um, but those people who do have those additional support needs, it would be really good to learn a bit more about what you're doing to do that in, alongside that work that you're doing for those leaseholders. Um, and my final question to you, um, Britu, is whether you think the new PASS um, 9980 is delivering a better system for assessing um, fire, the fire safety of buildings, and if yes, why, and if no, why? Um, so I'd just like to clarify that uh, we uh, represent uh, um, leaseholders, uh, uh, you know, living in uh, buildings which may have fire safety issues. Uh, we, uh, you know, have not really worked with tenants, so I it would be inappropriate of me to answer that part of the question, I'm afraid. Um, I will answer the question about PAS 9980. Um, well, at the moment, it is too early to tell, really, if PAS 9980 is a better system or uh, not. Um, at the moment, what we know is that it is extremely complicated. It is extremely long. It's not a simple system. Um, we personally believe that it's going to take, you know, many, many months for fire risk assessors to get to grips with this new system. Um, in spite of PAS 9980 being introduced, banks are still asking for EWS1 certificates with favorable ratings before they will lend on them. We now have a situation where bill, uh, insurance companies are asking every single building to conduct a survey of their building and give them details of the external wall framework before they will even provide a quote um, on buildings insurance. And this is buildings regardless of height. Um, it has nothing to do with PAS 9980. Um, so again, it is unclear to me what the position of RICS is, uh, because after the, you know, the, the last time I checked, they were still insisting on using their own guidance rather than PAS 9980. So on the ground, what this means for leaseholders is more complexity, more misery, more limbo. We are being subjected to survey upon survey at our own cost. If one survey doesn't go the way of the managing agents or the freeholders or the developers, we are being told we need to do it again to another methodology. So instead of simplifying matters, for example, you know, like the government taking on the responsibility of surveying block by block, 
standardized in a standardized way using you know a pool of uh, assessors um we, you know the government has still just left it to a motley group of fire risk assessors to wade their way through this past 9980 you know fire risk assessors who have different degrees of skill competence knowledge and try to figure out whether you know the building requires remediation or not uh, to me frankly speaking five years on this does not seem to be a good strategy but as i said it is too early to tell uh, we will have to wait to see how this plays out Okay, thank you. And if I could just really quickly ask um, the same question about um, people in sheltered or supported accommodation to the Assistant Commissioner, um, what your views are about the protections that those um, residents have? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I think this comes back to the Commissioner's comment about why we're looking at a risk-based inspection programme, because currently you can have a care home that's the same risk and frequency as perhaps a higher education establishment and clearly the risks are very different. So what we want to do, and this is why we've got the work underway, so we can actually make sure we target buildings such as care homes and give use the highest level of capacity, while things like our fire safety checks, which our firefighters have rolled out, or even self-service tools online can be used for where the need is not so great. So in short, the answer is yes, we are very focused on where the risk is the highest, and that's a combination of the person and the building and what the people do. I don't know what your views are on that last question I asked about PAS 9980. Uh, I would have to agree with Ritty that we have to look at it. Uh, I know that we've spoken in the past about the culture and I think it's often interpretation of guidance and it's about making sure that people do the right thing. Speaking to our fire engineering team, it, we, we've seen a few cases and it, it's clearly a discovery phase I think for those people doing those surveys and, and using it as a tool. But we are keeping a very close focus and we are looking to feed back both to industry groups representative groups and to the national piece to try and make sure that things are done correctly. Thank you. Um, and, and just to say thank you to all our guests for all your contributions today. Well, this is uh, me too and Charlie, thank you. Um, can we note the report in today's discussion? Noted. And can we also delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with the party with the, with the party group lead members to agree any output from the discussion? And can the, can the committee note its work program for 2022-2023? And the date of the next meeting of this committee is the 5th of July to, uh, 2022 at 10 a.m. in the chamber at City Hall. Okay. I have no urgent business, therefore I declare this meeting to be closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for